Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So I think we'll get started now. This session is looking at the future of the planet, a small topic, and one we've talked about already several times over the last two days. Um, but I think we're going to really get into the heart of the matter here and look at it as an intergenerational issue. And so before we get in, talk to our wonderful panel, I just wanted to ask the question and help us reflect on why do we think about climate change and the future of the planet more generally as an intergenerational or multi-generational question? Well, part of the answer is about history. So in 1992, when I was in fourth grade, um, every country in the world came together in a UN conference and said, we shall prevent dangerous changes in the Earth's climate. Can I ask see who in this room was not born in 1992? So in the lifetime of, it looks like the majority of people in this room, countries have met again and again and again to try to meet that promise and have thus far failed to meet that promise. Because during uh, the last decades while countries have been negotiating, the world has reached already one degree of climate change. We've already changed the climate by one degree on average versus pre-industrial levels. And so we're not on track. We know to get on track, we have a big job in front of us. We have to cut our emissions in half, more or less, by 2030, over the next 11 years. And we have to bring them to zero by the middle of the century, by 2050. And we probably have to go even beyond that and to go into negative emissions, begin taking things back out of the atmosphere after that, especially if we're not fast enough in our mitigation efforts over the next decades. So we've already been talking about this as an international community for 30 years, and we're not yet on track. So why again look at this as an international problem? If you look at the numbers, they're very, very clear. This is an interesting graph I can show you in a minute. Um, looking at the carbon budget of people born in different years. So to keep our climate uh, and safe degrees, we have a sort of total amount of carbon we can emit called the carbon budget. That's our maximum amount of emissions we can do. Um, and if you break that up based on what's already happened and what's likely to be possible going forward, it means that every one of us, every country, every person gets a sort of allocation of that total sum of carbon budget. And this graph shows you in the blue line what we'd need to do, what every person would get out of that if we got on track to our 1.5 degree limit, which is what we're hoping to achieve. If you look at the numbers, you can see someone born in, say, 1954, 1955, is getting quite a lot of that budget, 351 tons for a two degree world, or 326 tons for a 1.5 degree world. And someone born, let's say, in 1992, when that agreement was struck, is going to get only 249 tons for a two degree world, or 184 tons, so quite a bit less. And of course, that's the global average. If you look actually at how this plays out across different countries, this is some great information from the website Carbon Brief, you can see this is even more starkly divided between countries because so many countries have already emitted so much of the carbon budget. Um, and so if you look at a person born in the middle part of the last century, um, you know, someone born in the United States or Europe gets a much higher budget than someone in China or India, and those numbers begin to converge over time. So if you look at the difference between someone in, say, India, born at the turn of this century, versus someone born in, say, the United States of the last century, you're talking about an order of magnitude of difference, or two orders of magnitude of difference in terms of the global carbon budget. And if you're curious, go to this website, it has some really good figures, but the point is that this is starkly unfair starkly unfair, and part of that unfairness is intergenerational, part of it is international, uh, part of it is of course intranational because people are, who are uh, emitting more carbon tend to be in the wealthier parts of society. Now if you looked at the, had similar graphs looking at the impacts of climate change, it would be exactly the opposite. People who will feel the greatest force of this are people who live in the future, people who are lower down in the socioeconomic ladder, and people who live in countries at lower levels of development. So this fundamental unfairness of the climate change problem is uh, a stark geophysical reality that we face as we try to solve it. And so someone yesterday um, asked, why aren't young people angrier? Why aren't we angry about this? And I don't know if you saw Greta Thunberg's speech at the United Nations Climate Action Summit in New York last uh, two months ago. Um, but it seemed pretty angry to me. And if you look at the school strikes around the world, 
And according to Fridays for Future website, there's been 52,000 school strikes around the world over the past few years. 11 million people in those strikes in nearly every country in the world. Um, have a look, and if, you're, if you think the anger is still not enough, look at the version of the Greta Thunberg speech, speech which has been set to Swedish death metal. This is a really good version of the, of the anger. Um, so the question, of course, is not just about the intergenerational starkness of it, but how we move forward and how we use this kind of power emerging from young people around the world, and is that going to be something that's going to help us actually solve this problem in a way that we haven't been able to do so so far. So I'm delighted that to talk about this issue, we have a great panel with us here today, and also some great people in the room. So let me just quickly introduce them, and then we'll jump into it and get discussing. So to my immediate right is uh, Nina moger Bankston, who is a member of the Danish Youth Climate Council, which is a special organization that she'll tell us more about in a, in a moment, but a way to try to institutionalize youth representation in Denmark and the country she comes from. But Nina currently works as a policy advisor in the European Parliament, um, and is co-authoring a book on climate activism. Um, so has a lot of views on the subject, both as an activist and also someone working in the policy system. And to her right is uh, Lola Fayukan, who is a student at LSE, and someone who's been heavily involved in the UK Student Climate Network, which is a grassroots organization here in the UK, which has been very involved in the Fridays for Future climate strike movement. And she's particularly uh, interested and has worked with the organization's Green New Deal work, um, looking at how uh, climate action can be a tool for promoting anti-racism and decolonization of the environmental movement as a whole. So welcome to you both. So my first question for you is um, actually a personal one. So there's a lot of anger in the world. We see a lot of people coming out in the streets. What brought you there and what keeps you there now? Can I start with you, Nina, maybe? Oh, uh, yeah, of course. Um, I think my first sort of political awakening is that Actually, this year is sort of a 10-year anniversary. Um, 10 years ago, the, the COP15 conference was held in Copenhagen, where I'm from. Um, it was an absolute disaster. Um, Copenhagen, uh, COP15 was supposed to have been Paris. Um, there was supposed to have been a global deal, and it failed. And I remember very vividly this combination of, of images of massive protests in the street, and then uh, hundreds of people being arrested and placed in human trains on this sort of cold December ground. Um, people were using their very limited power to try and influence for the better of our planet. And then contrasted to this uh, group of politicians who had massive amounts of power and were not using it. Um, and so from then on, sort of, uh, I think out of frustration and anger with sort of the lack of structural change, I made you know, classic personal choices. I think that's how many people get involved. Um, became vegetarian, started volunteering in a plant nursery, um, and then started campaigning at my local high school for sort of the removal of plastic and uh, sort of lessened meat consumption in schools. Um, so it's a sort of classic, like, activist um, start, and then I sort of coming on from that have uh, leaned into to the political spectrum to try and actually push the change from inside and constantly facing this battle of whether I, I truly believe that that is actually working. Right. And what, what got you involved? Um, I think I started when I was um, looking at the American context. So what really got me involved um, in climate activism in particular um, was the Green New Deal in America. And I remember just thinking, like, why don't we have this here? And I learned that the Green New Deal was actually developed here, like, about a decade ago by a group of um, journalists and policymakers and all sorts of politicians, um, and it just never picked up traction. And I felt like there was something wrong about the fact that as a young person who cared about climate, who had been taught about climate in school, and who understood that climate change was a thing, I would never really been presented with any kind of... Um, way to create that change. I've never been presented with the urgency of that situation. I've never been clearly communicated to me. And it was kind of all these contradictions between, you know, understanding like, the scale of the problem and then the responses which never seem to be commensurate with that. And then looking at um, when the climate strike started, um, that was when I really felt like this is the outlet for me. Like, this is something that I can do. This is the way that I can get involved and make my voice heard. And it was seeing that which really inspired me and then just going out on the streets and the feeling of that process of thousands of young people um, on the streets of London where I was um, 
like with so much energy and anger and really caring, not just playing truant, but really caring about the future of our planet. That inspired me more than anything ever has before. And it was from there that it basically spread out of control. And I find myself here like six months later, so yeah. Right. So just a quick poll of the audience. How many of you in the audience have been to a climate protest of some kind? Raise your hand. Okay, so we're speaking to uh, the converted here in some ways. Um, that's great. So probably some of the experiences that brought Nina and Dula in probably I imagine resonate with some of you and reasons for getting involved. But a question I think we're all asking is why now? And why has this really picked up so much steam in this moment in time? Um, any thoughts on why? You know, that's your story, but is that for everyone's story or why is it happening this way? Um, I think it has a lot to do with um, the especially with um, like the climate strikes that I do, I feel like the reason why it's resonated with so much people is the moral urgency of like that it's bringing to the table. The fact that um, we are finally starting to talk about solutions which which do do kind of strike at the, the size of the problem. I feel like if you say, oh, our planet is dying, everything is on the line, you know, put your recycling in a different bin and then like that's going to solve the whole issue. Those kind of two things don't really add up. Like, it doesn't make sense to say you can take one specific individual action when our in and that's going to solve the whole problem. When, if we're trying to convince people that, you know, it's everything, we have everything to lose. Um, but then also bringing positive solutions. So the fact that we have everything to gain as well, that we can take this moment and look at what's caused it and fix, when we fix those issues, we all create something which is so much better. So kind of um, speaking in that kind of, language to people really resonates with them and the fact that it is like um, there have been so many young people so many children so many like toddlers primary school kids going out on the streets um that obviously that resonates with people you know they understand that it's my life on the line it's my children's life on the line my grandchildren and that means something to people and they're starting to listen yeah you know why now i think i think there are two things um one is that there's been you know, generations before us who actually laid the ground groundwork um you know, Greenpeace have been campaigning on this for decades, um, and I believe strongly in tipping points, and I think that that groundwork that they've been putting down um, has, if, if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be here. Like, um, so it's spectacular to, to have Greta now as a face of this movement, but, it, you know, it's not her who created the movement. You know, it's thousands of people before her. Um, and then I think, you know, in sheer numbers, I think there's just something very particular about our generation, which is um, uh, sort of, I think a lot of this movement is driven by fear. Um, and my hope for the future is that we can get more hope into the movement. But I think the most defining part of my uh, you know, growing up was the financial crisis. Um, the, this idea that my future is not necessarily going to be better the, or what, what I've been promised or what I've been told, you know, uh, that it's going to be better than my parents. Um, and, like, for me, you know, from Denmark, very privileged background, like, I'm not facing the, you know, the massive burden of this crisis. But across the world, the young generation is not, you know, necessarily able to get a better future than what we've seen in the past. And so I think this, uh, this existential threat um, and the atomization of us as, an, as a generation has sort of meant that here was a movement that actually created a sense of belonging, something to hold on to, right? We don't have religion to, to hold on to. We don't have our family structures to hold on to. We sort of live in a, in a, in a place and in a time where everything is just atomized. And so this movement for me, and I think for a lot of other kids as well, was a, like a, a community and a sense of belonging and something to hold on, something to fight for. Mm. Right, and that's similar to what you said, a, a community. So um, I, you know, I'm really interested in this question of why now because um, I was a climate activist before it was cool. <laughs> in, in, hipster. A hipster in. <laughs> so when I was in high school, I was a student environmental activist. This is in the late 1990s. And I remember going to Washington to lobby my senators uh, to support the 1997 Kyoto Protocol, which they then didn't do. But, uh, but many uh, people were concerned with this issue at that time, as you said, but it didn't reach a uh, wildfire effect that we see now. Um, so I think this is really an interesting kind of dilemma. Um, 
But is it wildfire? One of the other questions people raise is, well, this is maybe a, a movement we see mostly in Europe, maybe in North America. You know, that, that website of recording all the school strikes shows, yes, some global reach, but maybe the numbers are a lot smaller in other parts of the world. So I'm just curious, those of you who raised your hands, those of you who come from countries that are not in Europe or in North America, what does this look like in that context to you? Is there a youth movement in Africa, in India, in China, in other parts of the world? So a lot of you raised your hands before, so I'm going to ask you to raise your hands again. Yes, please. Um, so I'm coming from India. Sorry, let's wait for the microphone so everyone can hear us. Sorry, I keep asking so many questions and sharing so many of my opinions, but I come from India. I'm, I'm in... I'm from Bangalore down south, and the climate strikes have been happening there as well. And like Nina was mentioning, there was a lot that we were trying to do um, in school before it became cool to go and strike and before it became fun to have a photo up there. We were doing a lot back in our schools. We were trying to get single-use plastic banned. We were trying to get, uh, trying to revamp the entire water conservation system in, in our schools, in our communities, get more rainwater harvesting to happen. So it has been happening for a while, but it's really picked up momentum now, and I'm so glad that it has. It's, it's high time we, you know. Mm. I was actually in, in Delhi earlier this year for a research project that I'm doing, and I attended one of the, the Delhi school strikes, which was extremely vibrant, so that was interesting. There's a point here in the back, please, yeah. Oh, sorry, just one second. Can you get that mic going? No, still not working. Okay, I think my name is Swapnil, and I come from India as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And I come from India as well, and I lead a program uh, with an organization called as Infosys, where we want our uh, infrastructure to be a carbon neutral uh, infrastructure, right? So mm -hmm. there have been a lot of uh, efforts that we have been personally driving, not only in our organization, but also across the community in terms of uh, energy, water, waste. Mm -hmm. uh, rural electrification programs. Okay. And, and are the youth involved? Uh, absolutely, yes. The average age of employees working in uh, at Infosys is 28 years. Right. right. So, they, so uh, and then we also have a lot of people from the community who mm -hmm. uh, who are a part of these initiatives, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we are on track to be a carbon neutral company by 2020 in all the three scopes. Right. So we are close to two lakh employees uh, in the organization. Right. Like maybe some of this hope that Nina was looking for before. And one final comment here in the, in the front. Um, I'm from India as well, and a lot of my work uh, has been in rural contexts where I've worked with forest-dependent communities, um, not, not urban at all. And one thing that I've realized is that this narrative in itself is a very urban elite narrative and one of the most interesting things that one can do is to actually ask indigenous people or you know um, their perspectives on climate change because for them it's a very very local issue it's an, ex an issue of their existence um, and I honestly think that for us to really make an impact for us to, to be able to make this um, a, you know, an all-encompassing movement, that narrative needs to percolate and it needs to be, it doesn't, it shouldn't be couched in these like expert terms and, mm. you know, that black box sort of idea. And that is something that I think is the need of the hour. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't take solace from the fact that Delhi is having climate strikes and Bangalore is having climate strikes. We need to look at the other areas as well. Right. So, so yeah. I might come back to you a little bit about the decolonization of the environmental movement. Is there anyone and this is not in any way an offense to Indians, but is anyone not from India who has a perspective to share on this? I see one here in the middle. Hello, my name is Bivishika, and I'm at the NSEG program, Nature um, Society and Environmental Governance at the School of Geography and Environment. Um, I am not from India. I am from Nepal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the strong South Asian representation. Great. Yes, um, but then uh, what I was also, um, what I wanted to bring up was also what, similar to what Shishti was uh, saying, that these issues and climate strikes and things, uh, this has happened um, and continued to happen way before it was really cool. And um, what is happening right now is, yes, we are having climate strikes, but in urban settings and in urban areas where children are and students are going out and participating with their, you know, placards, etc. But what is happening in the process is that um, a lot of other voices of indigenous people, especially from my 
my community is like mountain communities and their voices and uh, voices from the people of the mountains and how their lives have been affected. That uh, is still not getting any momentum and no one is bringing it out there and it is still invisible. Right. So that is how the, you know, um, how, that is how it's been framed and sort of like taken over. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, did you want to come in on this point? Because you've been working on these ideas of how we get more voices and uh, maybe criticize or, or critique some of the ways that environmental messages have been portrayed in the past. Mm. Um, I think it's this is something which is really linked to the work that I um, have been trying to do within um, my organisation, which is the UKSCN. So we host the climate strikes in um, <clears throat> primarily across England and Wales. Um, and it's been incredibly difficult um, we have been working very, very much with um, like indigenous actors um, in the London strike, which is where I'm based um, and like where I'm involved with. Um, like the majority, um, the majority of the speakers, I would say, were from indigenous backgrounds. We had um, people from across the world, um, and yet when you look at what the media obviously tends to focus on, that was completely lost in that discussion. Um, and so it's difficult. We have been doing so much work, especially with, um, I remember recently we did um, some work with like Brazilian solidarity with um, the people that work, like the indigenous people, activists that are there. Um, and we've been doing so much work trying to reach out to, to make form solidarity in other ways with other actors, like um, people that are doing um, work against fascism, people that are doing work against um, like in, more social justice issues and trying to make those links and trying to make it make people understand that climate is not just a singular issue it's a social issue and that like you know changing it is going to require so many fundamental changes which are going to strike at the heart of colonialism and that system um, but it's difficult it's really really difficult to to make the media pay attention to that so what we're doing is we're trying to build those links on an individual level with those organizations with those activists um, and especially when um, people are in rural contexts, that is more difficult to do. But we're trying to look beyond the ways things have traditionally been done. Um, even within the environmental movement, obviously there's a lot of disagreement on this. And some organisations take different approaches. And even within kind of the climate strike movement, if you want to call it that, there are different ways of approaching this. I think the way I kind of want to see the climate strike um, move, the direction I want to see it go in, is um, a lot of our focus on international solidarity has been very European, and I've found that so frustrating time and time again. Um, a lot of things do take place in a very, even, you know, we're talking about international and within nations, the kind of levels of inequality. Um, not only is there that international inequality of whose voices across the world are being, like, platformed, but also within the UK, who is it that's able to take part in climate strikes, who is it that's able to be an activist while they're at school, who is it that's able to do that? When we look at these, what's going on there, it's, you know, it's often it's the same types of people who are able to do this kind of thing. And um, it's just, we can't reproduce these structures, we want to get rid of them. So it's something which we are really working on. Mm -hmm. um, and we're trying to really list, like, put those people at the forefront and listen to them, people that are on the front lines, people that are doing this work, we support them in their protests, we come out with them when they're doing what they're doing, and we try and platform them in the media. But it's going to take, at the end of the day, it's going to take us forcing policy to change. And that's something that we have seen in terms of um, the Green New Deal, what we're trying to make it be. There are different ways this can go. And the way we want to promote is one which is entirely anti-colonialism and which is really doing that and really forefronting, getting rid of extractive industries and forefronting those people that are at the um, front lines. Mm. So I'm glad you raised the Green New Deal because I think that's exactly the link that we're, has come up in the past two days. We've talked about technological change, we've talked about economic change, and people have often mentioned climate change in the context of those larger questions. So now we have a chance to talk about it centrally. So when people mention the Green New Deal, they mean many things often. And people support something called the Green New Deal, who are as diverse as uh, the new president of the European Count, uh, Commission, uh, Michael Bloomberg, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, these are all people who say this is a great idea, but maybe mean quite different things by it. So I'd be curious, you know, from your working in the European Parliament, this is a very live discussion there, you're saying the Green New Deal is something that brought you into this idea and have a vision for what it should be. So what does it mean to you, and how does it connect to these broader discussions we've been having? So I think, 
I think you're hitting a very true point that um, when you have endorsements from as wide a spectrum as you see, it it becomes a concept that means very little. Um, but what it does do really well, um, regardless of sort of where you are, is that it, it provides the positive message. So uh, the I, I really believe that the climate movement has been built as big as it is because of the fear um, that is really, really present within the entire young movement. I think that for most of us, our future ends at 2050. Like, we just don't imagine what's, you know, beyond on, at the other end. Um, Some of us are our time horizon is the end of this conference. So what the Green New Deal is, does is that it then sort of reverses the conversation into a positive message of uh, rather than just a sort of austerity measures, which means that you know we need to cut back on X, Y, Z um, to live up to our to our parents. There's also here the potential of you know creating a actual prosperity for um, people, especially low income in, from low income groups. Um, yeah. What does it mean to you? I think it primarily means um, a means of achieving social justice. I think that, um, you know, that's entirely right. Like, it has been something which has been co-opted to a certain extent, and it is something which is can be quite non-specific. But I think that, you know, that, that, that requirement for a positive vision is so, so important, and one which is systemic is so important. I think that the Green New Deal captures both of those things. I think that, um, kind of, I, too, have very deep reservations about this like um, narrative of fear and um, a lot of the stuff I've been trying to do um, around like anti-racism um, within the environmental movement has been like who loses out when we kind of promote this narrative of there's no time left we have to do everything we can what is it that we're going to do who is it that we're going to sell that like who is it that we're going to give up on so that we can you know achieve our targets as quickly as possible I think the Green New Deal um, as in its principles, would try to promote um, an international approach, one which is founded in equality that is about rapid um, decarbonisation um, and about prosperity, but not a form of prosperity which um, allows us to get drawn into this idea that our lives aren't going to have to change in any kind of way. Because I think that um, when, if we kind of go down that route, there is the... Um, there is the risk that it will be, you know, a nice, um, like, climate-neutral world for us with all our electric cars, while um, the global south continues to suffer. Um, so I think that the Green New Deal can mean a lot of different things, but for me, it's about taking that positive vision, which so many young people have um, been mobilising around, um, which has brought so many people into this movement, and then defining that, making sure we don't lose that fight for what it has to mean and what it has to mean for all of us. Yeah, I think. Um, this idea that Green New Deal is a way to build a broader coalition, to point, give people an optimistic vision of what a, a decarbonized society might have in it for them in the future is, is a really powerful political uh, construct. And so thinking that, I was surprised to see on Twitter a few months ago um, an, a long uh, African climate negotiator who's been negotiating climate change um, for the African group of countries, uh, which negotiates a block in the UN process um, for many years, he said, you know, I hate the Green New Deal on Twitter. So I, I was, reached out to him and said, I'm surprised you say that. Why would you say that? And he said, well, it's because I've been talking about climate justice for th 30 years. Mm -hmm. And only now that it's people in developed countries who are worried about their jaws being lost that the world actually thinks they, we should care about justice. Mm -hmm. And I, I was kind of quite uh, taken by that because it, it does seem that um, this broader question of the intergenerational, international, international uh, inequities that we, I talked about at the beginning, um, you know, if it's, if it's only some of us who are going to make it, then it's going to be harder for any of us to make it because of these worries about unfairness that are fundamentally different. So how would, I mean, I'd be curious, how would you respond to this uh, tweet if you were going through your feed and you were like, ah, would you, um, what would you say? Um, I would want to like it. Um, I do like the Green New Deal, obviously. Um, but there's nothing incorrect about that, about coming from that perspective. Um, and this is... This does kind of lead to a lot of the issues I have, again, like with that kind of narrative of fear, is um, this kind of idea that we've only got a certain amount of time left, we've only got a certain amount of degrees left. Um, it's like, 
that's for us. Like, that is a very, um, you know, that's a, that really centres certain perspectives when we're kind of talking about um, just over a decade left to kind of solve climate change. Climate change has been affecting a lot of people for a very long time in very, very severe ways. And to kind of speak about it as a problem of the future or a problem of um, a problem which almost a problem that we have time to solve. Like, it's, it's, it's now and it's been happening for a very, very long time. And it's something which, you know, it's entirely correct to say that it's something which we've only started to um, really kind of um, care about now that we're seeing that it's going to affect us and also care about in ways which are very centred on, um, like, I mean, obviously I'm speaking from like, the British context, so like British perspectives and how that's going to affect us as a country. Um, and I think that's, as already said, incredibly difficult to decentre. Mm. And so my response would be, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't respond to it in 140 characters, <laughs> um, but I'd probably say that I'd pro I would look at that and think, you know, that's, you're entirely, that's entirely valid. Um, I wouldn't, I obviously still support the Green New Deal and support people in positions of privilege, trying to use that privilege to centre different narratives. But kind of the idea that, um, the idea that we're not um, kind of coming from a very almost self-centred perspective in the kind of way this entire debate has been, has been framed, um, I think would be incorrect. Like, that's definitely true. Nina, retweet, not retweet. <laughs> I don't have Twitter, uh, um, but... Good. <laughs> um, I think it sort of also gets at the core of one of these the big issues, which is that, you know, the nature of politics is that, you know, the place where it sort of actual power lies is still nation states. And um, I think, I think it was 2017 where China, they, they made some quite uh, um, ambitious targets for electric vehicles. Um, they wanted 8% of all vehicles sold um, in the year after to be electric. And then for that to add by 2% every year, two percentage points. Um, and then Germany, um, who saw the, you know, this is a quite a big threat to their auto industry, went in and lobbied against it. So uh, a country where, you know, that has bred Ursula von der Leyen, the commission president, um, and who claims sort of to be a, a leader on the climate agenda, is then going in and telling, you know, China, hey, you know, calm down, maybe postpone a year, or, you know, lessen percentages. Um, and, and, you know, their interests are bound up in their electorate, the, in the German electorate. Um, and whether, uh, you know, what determines, you know, polit political interest is getting re-elected, and whether that is determined by, you know, broader swings or money, in, depending on where you are, that is also going, what's going to drive political decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's, that's something I struggle a lot with, also, you know, being inside that system. It frustrates me on a daily basis. Mm. Um, and also why I have a lot of faith in non-state actors to drive this change forward. Um, I think you see cities uh, as, a, as a big driver of change. You also see companies um, across the world as a, as a bigger driver of change. Yeah, we'll come back to some ideas for hope in a second. But before we do, I want to come back to this kind of more process-related theme, which you picked up a lot yesterday morning. Um, thinking about how youth, how young people can be meaningful and meaningfully involved in decision making around climate change as one issue, but of course in other issues as well. Um, and uh, how this movement that we're seeing, uh, what's going to happen to it? Is it actually going to result in the kinds of institutional changes that result in lasting, meaningful change? Or is it going to flash in the pan and, and dim down and be replaced <coughs> by something else in the future? So, um, I mean, Nina, you've been part of this special commission that Denmark has. So can you tell us a little bit about how that works and what scope you think that has to meaningfully involve young people in decision making? Of course. Um, so I, I sit on a thing called the Danish Youth Climate Council. And uh, it's a small body where 10 people appointed by the Minister of Climate who are then uh, tasked with providing policy inputs for the minister on green policy, essentially. Um, and it's existed since uh, February, March of uh, this year. So it's quite new. Um, and it's been a really interesting process uh, to see. Um, I, I think to a large extent it was created as sort of a more um, a publicity stunt than anything else. It's a very, very easy and cheap way to look green, uh, to say you're drawing in young people. Um, and then sort of our perspective on, on it you know, was that, 
okay, then we'll have to use this platform. You know, it's been given to us, and it might have been a hoax, but then you know, you know, let them regret it. Um, and and I think what's been interesting is just that I think what the platform did do was give us a, a, a better chance to get in touch with actors outside of the ministry, but. The, like the many hours that we spent on actually you know, developing and writing and gathering information for the policy proposals, I think are largely, you know, you know have n had no impact. Um, so no impact. I, I don't think so. I think what impact it has had is that it's another platform for um, mobilization. Um, it's, an, it's another platform for, for hope for, for other like younger, younger kids. Um, and then also, it then gives us access to uh, people in sort of the private sector, people who work in the NGOs, people sort of who are working in the movement. So it is a platform, and it does have worth, but it's not actual, you know, proper youth involvement in decision making. I think the more I, like I, I was also at the UN Climate Summit in um, in New York in this September, and it's the same thing, right? They had a massive youth summit, um, but. It was held two days before the actual conference. Um, so you know, the, the rooms where the decisions were made or where the important people were you know, didn't overlap with the rooms where the young people were. And um, I think where you know, the power of the young people in New York at the, at the Climate Summit was out in the streets on Foley Square. Um, it's massive protest. Um, and so I think you know, if you want to do something serious about the youth involvement, Maybe the like a be better answer is to lower the voting age. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, it's certainly a more direct way to have power. Have you been involved in any, any of these kind of dialogues with policy institutions or those that are trying to involve young people in some mm. way? And how did that look for you? Um, we've kind of encountered them. Mm. Uh, so I've encountered some of them several times in the last, uh, like basically, couple of months I've been doing this, um, and. I would say they are essentially just the same thing. Um, a lot of them are bodies which don't, don't really exist to give young people an actual voice. They exist um, or are created um, as publicity stunts, as um, things to, you know, so you can look good um, but not actually do anything or not actually spend any money. Um, I think that the main ways we've been able to actually have the main way we, ways we've been able to create change is by going out on the streets, and that's the only thing that we've seen create any difference. Um, even the difference that that's been able to create um, is arguable, but I think that people feel it and they see it. They see um, that the political climate has um, changed completely, and I don't think that we, that has been achieved by um, you know the various um, like essentially councils that um, the government has created to try and um, almost placate um, young voices. Yeah. Um, it's been created by the people that are in them um, kind of looking beyond that and kind of looking beyond like what that system is and looking outside um, and working with like activists and working with like other people who are actually quite, actually trying to get stuff done. Yeah, and I, I sit with that. So when I was you know, back in the late 90s again, there was a big project in my home state where I grew up to build a giant megaport, which was very controversial, and uh, there were no young people involved in it, even though this was going to be a multi-year, uh, multi-decade endeavor. And so we petitioned the governor, and we got onto this decision-making body, and we were like so excited that we had made it there, and we thought this is going to change everything, and it, and it didn't, actually. Um, and so that was one of the things that made me think a lot more about politics. And actually, um, we were talking before about the UN Climate Action Summit and the Youth Summit that happened there. Um, you know, a lot of young people talking about how they wanted to make a difference on climate change in the UN building. The woman who helped organize that is now running for office in her, in her home city. So her takeaway was very much, yes, we should do this, but to really make power, we need to then go into the system and make change as decision makers through voting, through running for office, through the tools of power that we know about. Um, so that goes back to our kind of inside-outside theme that we were talking about yesterday. Uh, Lily just said, you know, we need the people on the streets to make the changes and create the conditions under which decision makers are going to move in the right direction. But um, how does that then get, you know, institutionalized, really? Because if it's just a protest, we've seen plenty of protests from Occupy Wall Street to the Arab Spring, which have had a big impact, but then haven't actually uh, delivered all the expectations that people had of them at the time. So what's, what's your advice for where this movement goes next? 
Uh, Small question. Yeah. <laughs> try, to, try to keep it simple here. Right. Uh, I think I'd say it always needs to be both. Like, it always, you can't, um, I don't think you can look entirely to existing systems and expect them to do everything or look entirely to activists and expect them to do everything. Um, I think that we need to um, understand that, you know, no one person is going to do everything, but that when you have an entire movement or an entire um, political climate which is willing to make a change, you can um, have activists who are doing things on the street, and you can have um, politician, new politicians who are willing to platform that, and you can have them working together in consort. So it's about not focusing, I would say not focusing all our attention on just inside the system or outside the system. Mm -hmm. And also looking, as Doreen said, like the local level, looking at um, like if we want to create a new kind of a new way of doing things where not everything is about like motive, like mo motives of profit and um, short term thinking, mm. then we need to give people like we need to give people the power back. We need to give the power back to them. And it's like, how are we going to create those systems that allow us to do that? How are we going to do community organizing? Um, alongside activism, alongside like the political work, so that we can create change our entire system rather than just focusing on one kind of aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. Need any thoughts? Yeah, I think the the movements on the street, you know, do become institutionalized, even though you know then we don't make a a body in the ministry mm -hmm. for them or in the municipality or in your local government. I think what it, we should be comparing it to is. Um, you know, other mass movements, like the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, right? You had a combined pressure. You'd, you'd have your sort of Martin Luther King, who is, you know, conciliatory, who worked very much into the regular narrative. But then you also had Malcolm X, you know, who was threatening. Um, you had the feminist movement, the same thing, right? You, you had people willing to work with the establishment. And then you had women out there saying, like, no, we're going to smash your windows. Um, same thing now. You have sort of Fridays for Future movement, which to, to like a large extent is also quite peaceful, right? We go outside in the street and we have colorful signs. And then you have Extinction Rebellion on the other side, right? Um, and then I think what is like what, what that is doing is then also institutionalizing like the ideas behind it, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that we need to change our entire like perspective on how we live our lives. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what the movement does is it takes it away from being a practical question of, of efficiency or sort of political or sort of, uh, yeah, possibilities mm. and it makes it a moral question. Mm, right. Well, I'll come back to our, our colleague Eric on the moral question in a second because I know you have some things to say about that. But just to add to that ecosystem you've identified, uh, take the civil rights movement. Yes, you had Martin Luther King. Yes, you had uh, Malcolm X. But you also had, of course, Lyndon B. Johnson, the sort of consummate insider <laughs> politician, a good old boy from Texas, as he would often describe himself. Uh, he described himself in a saltier language than that, too. Um, but you had this very un improbable allies who came out to be quite central at critical moments. So interesting to think what that might, per might suggest or how we make these changes going forward. Um, interesting, it's been a conservative government here in the UK that's taken the first step toward legislating a net zero goal, probably something we didn't think would happen even a few years ago. So um, I'm curious to see how this all develops going forward. Um, I want to get some questions from the audience, but before we do, I want you to have a moment of deliberative democracy, because uh, Lola's put on the table, we need new decision-making patterns, so I'd like you to take just one minute before you ask your question and discuss it with the person next to you in the aisle. So that you can see if your question is the same as that person's question. And if it's not, you can have two questions. So just take one minute, tell, share your question with that person, and then we'll come back and hear them. <laughs> One thing that was actually quite interesting coming out of the UN summit was sort of meeting with some of the other activists from uh, the Global South who, were, who had the majority of the representation there. And I think one of the coolest coolest people I've ever met is named Paloma, and she's from Brazil and sort of working out of the, the Amazon. Um, and you know the work that uh, she, she sat on the stage next to Greta as, as Greta gave the speech. 
and you know, Paloma gave her own speech as well. And it was spectacular. It was a great, great speech. But there's just it's just so wild to see how you know, Greta is this palatable, you know, young, yeah. white sweet. Um, she's allowed to be so crazy angry. Right? She's allowed to, to cry and you know yell. And then um, and of course that gets attention also because she was already famous. But Paloma's speech, on the other hand, I think nobody remembered a word. Okay, I think that's been one minute. Come back together. Come back together. So there were a lot of hands before we started talking, and I'm sure there'll be even more hands now. So let's let's come back out of our bilateral conversations into our multilateral conversation and hear all the great questions we've gotten. So I'm just going to sweep of the room. Um, and as was said many more uh, many times before, the shorter the question, the more we'll have. So. Uh, please do think about others as well. <laughs> Any on this side? Oh, a silent section. We'll come back to you. Uh, one here. I see one, two, and we'll come back. Yeah. It's right there. Yeah. Hi, my name's Lola. I'm from the National Leadership Center, which is a unit of the Cabinet Office. Uh, so the conversation we've been having thus far, it's sort of hinged on this outsider-insider axis. And the inside we're talking about is people in government, in political process, and the outside are those on the streets, right? The activists who are moving. <laughs> But there is a third player we haven't addressed, and that's the polluting industries. And they stand to lose a lot more than we do as, as sort of people in these other two fields. And so with that in mind, how do you engage, defeat, tackle people who have been lobbying the people in the halls of power far more effectively than we have for 30 years or more? Great question. Our research, we call these people the obstructionists. Question behind you. Um, well, first, just congratulations on the fantastic work you're doing. Um, the, the reason why you're succeeding is because you have moral standing. Um, you know, future generations have been an abstract concept. They're now here, uh, and they're angry. Um, and uh, I wouldn't underestimate the impact that that's having. You, you said you were outside the room in the UN. I've heard from people who are inside that room um, that uh, it had a real impact. And it's partly because everyone in that room, the powerful people, are parents and grandparents. And getting hell from their kids uh, and the kids on the street has a real impact. Particularly, Greta has been brilliant at triggering, triggering theories of moral shame, which is a very powerful human emotion. My question, though, is how do you translate that moral standing into raw political power? Uh, because nothing will change until uh, the balance of political power changes. And um, I was uh, a senior, it, it, I was an advisor to the Danish prime minister during the disastrous COP. I was in the room, and I can tell you that the people who had power were the fossil fuel industries and industrial interests. Until you create countervailing political power against that, we won't uh, win. So that's my question. A stark challenge. Uh, let's go to the middle of the room. I see one here and one there, please. Um, hi there. Um, on the issue of platforming and giving like, indigenous groups... Sorry, uh, I should have said this before, but please introduce yourself. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm Nathan, and uh, this is Deshaun. Is it, um, we have a joint question? Great. Yeah, joint question. We were both talking about it. Great. Basically, um, in, on the topic of platforming indigenous groups, ethnic minorities, um, we're both students. Some student here, you're a student at Durham. How, like, practically... Because we're, like, trapped here for, <laughs> for quite a few years. Um, how do we, like, practically platform and give voices to these people who are geographically quite far. Um, how can we use our platform, also as students, to sort of give a voice to them and make sure that like, discussions like this, policies, bear in mind the working classes, bear in mind um, who, who the policies will affect um, practically. Great. Uh, there's a question behind you. And so if I can add to yours, how do we give people voice without making them tokens, right? Because that was a question we were having before. Thanks, Byron Fay. I'm an MPP student here. Uh, I see climate as obviously a, a massive ethical challenge, but it's also a massive economic opportunity. And companies like Tesla, um, the fact that renewables are now cheaper to um, form of energy than any other form of new generation around the world, are great examples as to, as to um, how the economics can also align um, with the challenge. I think that's a unique opportunity that this, um, this issue has, um, but others have not. So my question is, how do we better pursue those economic opportunities and also inspire youth 
to get out there and, and um, seize them. So for me, you know, the protesting is, is all well and good, but the real power of the change, I think looking back to this, this previous question, is ensuring that tomorrow's billionaires are the ones who have made their money the right way. Elon Musk, I'm sure, would agree. Um, see one here, one here, one here, one here, one here, uh, and then we'll, we'll come back. <laughs> so, yeah, you can start at that side and work, work your way down. Hi, my name is Savannah. Um, so, obviously, you've highlighted the importance of activists in the street. Um, what are your opinions on the concern that's been expressed about whether using the term strike to refer to kids walking out of school, uh, whether that trivializes the rights of workers who need to use strikes? Good question. Uh, one in front here, and then we'll go there and down here. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Desma. I'm a student here. I'm originally from Kenya, and I've actually been doing a lot of uh, activism back in Nairobi. And through my time, I've come to realize that, as people have dis been discussing here, um, going on the streets and shouting is actually limited to a number of people. Okay. It's actually limited to st people who believe it's a priority, but then they have time because there's so many things that are a bit more prioritized in Africa and developing country because number one, how do I get a job when I'm young? How do I get food? So if they have that, if, if they don't have that, they don't really see the need to prioritize climate agenda because it's something that they need to think about in 10 years when they need yeah. more agendas that they need to be focusing on right now. Um, so with respect to that, maybe sometimes I believe that activism or going to the streets to shout is not a sustainable solution for people in developing countries or in Africa, in my opinion. But then as much as it is, I'm still doing something to get the government to be acting. But then uh, I'm, also in the, uh, I'm, I'm also in the government, so I'm actually trying to lobby for uh, policies uh, through government initiatives where right now we're actually currently working on how to introduce carbon taxation. Uh, but as much as it is, my worry is, in the international spectrum, Africa contributes to less than 1% of carbon emissions in Africa, I mean, in the world. Uh, and uh, if we can actually get 12 countries to reduce their carbon emissions by half, mm -hmm. we could actually be able to reduce the, uh, the, uh, the increasing uh, degree here. So how can, number one, developing countries get more voice uh, in uh, ca uh, carbon change initiative uh, agenda and implementation. And then number two, developing countries have a different priority. They need to be developing, which also means that they need to be uh, meeting more. Uh, and how is or what needs to be done to be able to leverage the, the new and green innovations as an opportunity for Africa to develop and uh, how can we go about it? Great. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Question in the back. So I'm all the way in the back. Um. Hi, thank you for being here today and sharing your stories and experience with us. My name is Lily Sedegat, and I'm also a part of the Environmental Governance Program, the School of Geography. Uh, so my question to you has to do with a recent article that came out in the New York Times in the interpreter column about the rise of global protests but the decreasing uh, success rates. So we've seen a, a rise of protests up 70%, um, but the success rate has dropped to about 20% since 20 years ago. Um, and one of the reasons why, they say, is democracy is stalling out in the world, and that we're now at a point since World War II that the number of nations that are moving towards authoritarianism models um, is like considerably more than those who are moving towards democracy. So with that in mind, what are some alternative strategies aside from global protests that people can use and implicitly whether they're in the system or outside of the system, to kind of push the agenda forward. Thank you. Great, and I've seen many more hands have emerged over the time, but I have to go with the ones we saw first. So we'll come to the person in the front here, and then we'll have some time later for some more, I hope. Hello, I'm Lucas. I'm half Danish and half German, and an alumnus of the school. Um, the, in the beginning, you kind of established a baseline that we are, or at least I understood it that way, that we are at a tipping point right now, as opposed to 30 years ago, um, as Greenpeace started uh, um, 
campaigning on this and then the subsequent uh, campaigns on this have always been unsuccessful in a way or didn't go didn't go as far and now there's kind of the, the idea of we've reached the tipping point but do have we really i mean the, the, at least in Europe, which is my background, um, the debate, the, the big political debates over the past 10 years have been financial crisis, then what we call refugee crisis, whatever, uh, maybe security crisis, then now, now it's climate that we're discussing, but when the next financial crisis hits in a year or in two or in three years, uh, and the whole idea of a Green New Deal that combines social policies and climate policies hasn't picked up. Or hasn't been implemented properly. Uh, probably, are we just going back to discussing what is the most pressing issue for the most people yeah. at this given time? Yeah. Um, so, are we really at that tipping point? Yeah. So, I think a number of the questions have raised some questions about how, given different prioritization, if they're from future crises, from developing countries' context, how we can actually maintain and implement these ideas. Um, so, a lot on the table. Feel free to jump in at any points you want to pick up, and I'll make sure we come back to the ones that you missed. Um, yeah, there's a lot there. Um, <laughs> so I think I'm going to start the last one. So in terms of um, what do we do, like, is this actually a tipping point? Um, this is something that I question, like, quite a lot. Um, and often when I kind of say... Um, you know, I'm not sure this, if this is a tipping point. I'm not sure if we're doing enough. I don't know if this is different. It's obviously different because I don't... A lot of us don't have, like, the contextual reference. Like, we can't compare it to other moments because um, we didn't live through them. But often people who are, like, have been doing this work for a long time look at me and they're like, are you... Like, this is, this is something new? Like, whenever I say I'm re I really don't know um, if, you know, I, we're living in this moment, so it's, it's, in, it's impossible for me to say if it's different from any other... Um, people who have been doing this for a really long time, for decades, are like, no, you know, this is this is something new. The climate strikes and the other processes which have been going on and all different actors that are working around this have created um, in a different moment in our political climate in which there is, like, there is the ecosystem which is, in which change can take place. Um, and no matter how many times I'm sceptical, I always have this reiterated to me. Um, and I feel like I have to believe it's true. And... In terms of the aspect about if there's another crisis, um, will climate change be overshadowed? I think if there's another crisis, it needs to reiterate. We need to reiterate that the causes of um, the causes of crises, all the crises which hurt you know ordinary people, are the same. So the the causes of um, we 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 get into all these issues when we prioritise the society's motives, which are, don't have like the like the people at heart. Um, and it's about striking at that core and striking at the fact that all these issues are interlinked, that there is another financial crisis. Who caused that financial crisis? What allowed them to cause that financial crisis? And how is that linked to the other crisis which is going on in our society and why they're allowed to exist as well? In kind of attacking that entire framework which allows people to suffer on such a massive scale all the time. And if we can do that, if, that, if, it, if we go to a point where there's another crisis of any sort and um, you know, we don't have robust policy solutions yet, then we need to use that moment to kind of really, really, really reiterate that, really reiterate the fact that all these issues are interlinked and that we can't solve one of them without solving all of them. Mm. Nina, any thoughts? Yeah, I, th I honestly think that um, the fragility of the movement is being overestimated. I think it's now been more than a year where these really, really massive protests have been going on sort of on a, on a weekly basis across the world. Mm -hmm. um, and not only that, you also see actual real commitments. It was like one, I have a lot of critical things to say about the UN, UN Climate Summit. But one thing that was actually positive was that it was framed such that you, you could no longer give any speeches just to sort of come up and, and say, nice fancy words you had to come with concrete commitments and i think what was very impressive to see was that a commitment coming out of industry um whether that was the shipping industry or whether that was finance industry um like i think it was the there was a, a co coalition of getting to zero where um a getting to zero coalition where two thousand billion dollars in portfolio investments and in institutional investors committed to getting to zero by 2050 
it's not just a movement that is sort of uh, only taking place among uh, like young people across the world. It is actually also happening, you know, at other levels. Um, and and I think that me, that also holds on to some of this sort of stability because at the end of the day, climate change is also a massive, massive risk, you know, and. You know, if there's one thing that private companies don't like, it's risk, right? Yeah. So let's do rapid fire answers to all the questions that have been raised because we but, have a yes. lot to get there and we're going <laughs> to do our part as, as a panel to get to them. So uh, should climate strikers use the word strike? Yes. Yes. I agree. Yes. Oh, there's your answer. <laughs> can, I, can, I um, can I speak more? Yes. Okay. Um, so I would say yes. Um, I'll try and keep this very short. Um, I would say yes because, um, for several reasons, what we've been trying to do, at least um, in the UK, is um, striking with trade unionists, and we've really been working um, on working with campaigners who are trying to um, work, um, change the anti-trade union laws in the UK, um, and we've been doing that because as we were trying to work with, as we were trying to um, work with workers and kind of acknowledge that. Um, our tactics are inspired by theirs. Um, we were also finding that it was essentially impossible for them to really support us because of the ways that um, at least the laws are structured in this country, which um, really stifle um, the ability of workers to protest. And so we've really tried. We're really trying to fight at the heart of the system, which is making it so difficult for um, unions to come and strike with us on the streets when they're trying to show that climate change, um, that they consider climate change to be a massive issue, and also the fact that calling it a strike does acknowledge the fact that. We are we are doing something I think which is in, like it is destructive in a way which a lot of other protests aren't. When you go out from school and you block the roads, um, that is a commitment that you're supposed to be doing that you're not doing. You can get fined for doing that. There is um, like there are um, children who have been punished by their schools for not doing it. We've had um, police um, police in the UK who have been going to schools and trying to. Um, asking to have teachers to hand over lists of all the ch children that have been protesting. There are um, actual risks that like young people are going through when they go and strike. Um, and we think that using that term really acknowledges both the level of destru destru um, disruption, acknowledges the heritage that we kind of have and who we're drawing from when we're doing this. And it also acknowledges the bridges that we're trying to build. So Nina, going then to this question you raised before about uh, the kind of businesses that are taking action, does that connect to this opportunity question? Are we, how do we link together the uh, protests we see on the streets and the economic opportunities that this kind of transition might afford? Um, I think Kenya is actually a spectacular example of it. I think um, over the, in the past five years, uh, energy, uh, electricity penetration, uh, I was told yesterday by His Excellency, the ambassador, has risen from 23% to 80%. That's wild, right? And in, I don't remember if it's next year or the year after, it's going to be 100% renewable. And there's massive opportunity in that, you know. It is, it is lifting people up, and uh, it is creating prosperity that is also you know, in respect of our, of our common planet. Mm. Um, Lola, how do we platform people without making them tokens? Mm. Um, I think the main way we try to see this is um, starting off with discussion. So we, you know, we have access to so much technology now, which makes it a lot easier to find um, people from across the world and communicate with them. So what we do um, as kind of almost like the British contingent of the Fridays for Future movement is that we um, not only reach out to other Fridays for Future groups, um, but we also um, reach out to indigenous activists who are working here in the UK. Um, so one, like I would want to platform groups like um, Wretched of the Earth is a really incredible group which has a lot of indigenous activists um, who are doing incredible climate activism. Um, and kind of speaking to climate activists and seeing what they want you to do, um, rather than kind of starting from your perspective and then adding on like them, I would say is like the key to not making it tokenistic. And I'd also say that um, really making sure that when these people, when you have indigenous activists in your spaces, they, again, they have that freedom to say what they, what they want to say. They have they are, it is coming from their perspective and you're learning and listening to them and what they want you to do and kind of really having that be the forefront and that be your starting point rather than starting with what you want to do and then having them as like the face of it. So that, I think that's really key. Um, you know, this question of authoritarianism. So 
uh, I think last year was the year in which more p environmental activists were killed around the world than any previous year. So how does this kind of movement get power in a world where we're seeing less space for civil society? I think it's a phenomenal question. It's, um, I, I honestly don't know the answer. I think um, what is really key to acknowledge here is coming back to this debate that you have brought up, that you know, the, the real danger in environment, environmental activism is not on the streets of Copenhagen or London or you know, New York or, where, or Berlin or wherever, wherever, but it is my friend Paloma who is running a group of activists out of the Amazon rainforest, <clears throat> sorry, where Bolsonaro is like actively, you know, his government, they are actively trying to you know, not just you know, stifle their voices, but actually you know, target them as individual people. Um, and the recognition within the climate movement that the ones who are actually putting their life on the line are not the ones at all who are getting the attention um, is, I, I wish I had a, an answer for it, but I, but I think it's sort of just a massive issue that we have to grapple with as a, as a movement and where um, people like myself and who look like me and are where I am should be spending a lot more time trying to actually give out opportunities uh, and uh, you know, allow other voices to be heard. I think what was just a, like one example was when Greta gave her spectacular and very famous speech at the UN. Um, Set to Swedish death metal now. I'm yeah, exactly. Um, right next to her was Paloma. Um, she was sitting there. She gave a speech just before Greta. It was, it was wonderful. It was eloquent. Uh, she was hitting at the heart of the social justice issue. Um, but she is less palatable, right? She, you know, Greta, as a, like a young, white, Swedish girl, is allowed to be very, very angry um, and still be heard. Paloma is just not. Um, and so her, her you know, speech was not you know, broadcast on international media. So I think that really comes to the issue of power. And the last two questions we haven't addressed are around the obstructionists and how we convert moral standing into actual power. Mm -hmm. um, and so. Any thoughts on those two points? How do we channel this kind of moral uh, voice from people like Paloma or Greta or others and make it something that's actually commensurate to uh, companies that are responsible for some very, very large percentage of global GDP? I told you it's an easy question. <laughs> um, I think it was interesting what you said was that um, the people in the rooms, they started listening to the young people because they are also parents and grandparents. I don't know if I agree. Um, like, I, I'm, I recognize that, you know, I really believe that most people are, are good at heart. But I think what is moving political decision makers is not the fact that they all of a sudden realize that they have kids, um, but the fact that their voters now really, really care um, about the green agenda. Um, and having worked in politics myself, it's just, it's really crazy to see what it is that drives political decision making. And at the end of the day, it is what is going to keep them in power. Um, and uh, I, and then for, for, for the company side, it is what is profitable. Um, so I think from a, like a policy perspective, I think we need to pour a lot of money into, into investments, uh, sorry, into, uh, into uh, research of the green technologies that is needed. And I think that is a massive task for the rich countries who are the main polluters to do so, because that is going to not just benefit uh, themselves, but then we also need to give that technology out for free um, to the rest of the world. Um, and then I think the, the real power question is, uh, yeah, politicians might be in the plenary placing the vote, but what determines whether they you know, vote one way or the other is not necessarily their own beliefs in good heart. I think that's one part of it. But it is what you know, the, their voters, their constituency, and their uh, lobbyists in, in other systems want from them. So we're coming to the end of our time. But the good news is that we're going to have a chance to talk about this more after lunch in a special session, which I hope you all will come to, an intergenerational climate policy workshop, which I'll say more about um, after lunch. But please do carry on the conversation there. Before we end, though, I want to make sure we come back to this very, very, I think, maybe even the most important point about hope versus fear, if you will. 
Um, and and uh, the person I think I've heard talk about this most eloquently is Christiana Figueres, who is the former executive secretary of the United Nations Climate Change Secretariat. And she says we need to have both of these ideas in our mind at the same time. And actually, according to her, a mark of true intelligence is to be able to hold two kind of opposing ideas equally strongly in your mind at the same time. And this is, I think, an interesting way for us to think about climate change. So we need the hope to believe that we can make these massive changes that we need to make. We also need the fear to give us the urgency and the moral authority to make the case for doing so. Um, so you talked a bit about the hope side, but I want to make sure we get that in here too, because it would be a shame to leave this room without having this balance in, our, in each of our minds. So a lot of my work is about the thing you talked about, about cities and businesses taking action. If you add them all up, something like 40% uh, of global GDP is, is accounted for by the 6,000 companies um, who are taking some kind of climate action. Of the 10,000 cities and regions taking climate action, that's about a fifth of the world population. So it's huge swaths of activity moving forward. Actually, one of the things that I took out of the UN Climate Action Summit that was a positive thing was that now we have, some, I think, 66 countries committed to net zero by 2050. Not many of the big emitters, the point that was made, but still, 66 countries doing something that no one thought was possible for them to do even a few years ago. So there is this kind of momentum. There is this grassroots support giving us the urgency and the fear. But the final question is, what do we need to do over the next 10 years? Because this is where we have to really make the rubber hit the road. We've got this moment. Uh, coming up, but to get to half of the emissions we have now by 2030 is a really critical thing. So a question for both of you to end on, a question for each of you to keep talking about over lunch is, what are the things you're going to do in your work to get us to this critical next step? A decade to cut half our emissions. Is it going to be hope strategies? Is it going to be fear strategies? It's a mix of the two. What are you thinking about? Um, and it can just be a guess, because I think that's where we're, we all are at this moment. But your, your yeah, um, task going forward. We, the climate change movement in the UK supports um, light decarbonisation by 2030. Um, and we, the way we want to, we believe that we have a historic responsibility as Great Britain, as the UK, um, to really do the most um, as the place where the Industrial Revolution started to be the place where um, the climate crisis it created ends. Um, and the way we want to do that is primarily through, is, is through hope, because I would say that um, it, is, it is a narrative of fear which scares me, because the ways in, when you, when you start to only speak in terms of fear, that can be co-opted very quickly. Um, and it's very scary to think about who that's going to be directed against if we allow our narratives around climate change to just be around whipping up fear within people. Who is that going to be directed at? Will it be directed at the refugees at the shores? Will it be directed at the poorest in our society? Will it be directed about you know fortress Britain um, and you know um, closing the closing the gates and making sure that no one can have what we already have and just stockpiling until like we die? You know that's what we can turn into if we don't have this positive message of saying in the next decade we are going to create something new and we're going to create it by in a way which is just and which actually improves our world. And we're not going to keep striking until we achieve that. We're not going to stop striking until we achieve that. Great, and good point. The global peak, uh, zero, net zero by 20 middle, middle of century is the global average. So mm -hmm. some will have to move faster so that others will have room to catch up. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Hope or fear? <laughs> um, I think what we need is we have a, we have a figure of fear now in Greta. And we, we really need figures of hope. Um, and I think the way that, you know, concretely, in the, play, the avenues that I have and the resources I have that I could sort of use for that is we try to find some of the, the youth-led projects that actually have concrete solutions and then bring them to you know, decision makers. Um, and then at, sort of at another level, uh, I think like I have the ability and I think many people maybe in this room but at least at this conference also have the ability to have a giving pledge and it's very concrete, but um, you know we are we all have responsibility at a global level. And one thing is, you know, you can always try and like, raise other people's voices, but also by you know contributing ten percent of your or five percent or however much you can uh, to organisations that further voices of others. Um, so there are great many examples. Um, Oxford runs uh, sort of a, a program that also lists what are the effective organisations. Um, 
but yeah, I think hope is what's needed uh, at an individual level. Uh, organizing, you know, running act, act like activism yourself if you can't do that, uh, trying to contribute financially, um, and uh, and then you know trying to like raise the voices of others. Mm -hmm. So two notes of hope to end on. Thank you both, and thank you all for being here. We'll talk more about this after lunch. <laughs>